Thank you, Megan. So when Megan first reached out to me about, are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> so um, I looked at some of the stats, and of, of course, we're not there yet. My job at Afrinic is I travel around the continent because at Afrinic we decided that the best, the, the best way, we, the best thing that we could do to help push deployment was to make sure that engineers in this continent they had the skills, they had the training that was necessary to get this done. So, almost 45 countries later and 2,000 network engineers trained later, I could count on the fingers of both of my hands how many network engineers have gotten back to me, say, two months after the training and said, hey, I deployed IPv6. And it turns out that when I thought about it, they all fit a certain profile. They tended to be geeks who were typically high up the political hierarchy of the organization that they could do something solo and all with their teams. And almost without an exception, the work they did to turn on IPv6 was limited to the core of the network and the edge. So when I asked them, why haven't you pushed it out to users? And they said, oh gosh, I can't do that. It's, I mean, it involves something else that is outside my control, so I'm not able to do that. So my presentation is, I'm trying to provide some a framework that could change that. Um, so, quick poll, how many of us here think that Deploying IPv6 is important. I'm in good company. How many people think it's irrelevant? Panda. And how many people are not sure? Panda. So I'm in good company. Now, so IPv6 is important. We all agree it's important. And the, the, the latest stats about IPv6 deployment, that is the situation in Africa. It's all red. That's from Epini Labs. Don't mind the bleep about uh, the bleep, the green bleep there in Africa is Liberia. Something weird is happening. I think there's a block in the reporting. But Liberia seems to be the only country that is reportedly showing some significant amounts of IPv6 traffic. But that's Africa. Surely South Africa is doing better, right? Right? Wow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 0.25% or about 92,000 IPv6 users in South Africa. Clap for yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Can you feel the sarcasm? <laughs> Can you feel the sarcasm? We also learn our insecurities. So <laughs> okay. Another poll. Uh, for those of you who are um, network engineers here, how many of you have turned on IPv6 on the edge? On the call, services, users. Yeah, so this, this, this short poll that I've done here mirrors exactly my, what my experience has been with the few people that have gotten back to me, about 10 to 15 people after a training that I've done V6. It almost always is They've done it on the edge and the core. Services and users, that's no go zone. But why? Because I believe that services and rolling it out to users, that's the last part of the five hundred six. And here is why I believe that these people, these network engineers, are not going there. Like I said, it's a typical profile. Network engineer guy, CTO level, who can do it without asking permission from someone higher up and does not need resources from someone else. So I would contend that 90% of the problem is, is a lack of resources, time, skills, and money. This, I mean, it's relatively trivial to enable activists in an edge, but to push it to the users involves another department that is, might not be under your control. To push it to services 
involves another department that's not under your control, and there's police court issues involved. A smaller part of it is just failure execution. I think as network engineers, we know the nitty gritty of you know, turning stuff off. But doing that on a consistent basis is a lot harder. So here's what I propose. There are three things you can do to get out of this situation. First of all, we really didn't need a business case. Secondly, we need management championship. This is in line with, uh, I think I've heard about two or three pre presentations during this I week that say, look, it's a reason network engineers need to understand a lot more about policy. But also, network engineers need to understand the business model that drive the companies for which they work. <laughs> it's a responsible and professional thing to do. So management championship is important. And then, a small execution framework. That is what, in my opinion, gets us from the status quo of 0.25 to something much more significant. So how do we solve the resource problem? Business case plus championship. What's a business case? For those of us who evangelize IPv6, the standard business case is we are running out of IPv4, IPv4 exhaustion. But so the guy who wears the suit and controls the sources, what the heck does that mean? I believe that a good business case has to be linked to the strategic exhaustion means negatively for this strategic objective. That will get attention of an executive. If you can say, this is what deploying IPv6 means in terms of our corporate strategy, that will get attention. And this is why it's important. Nothing of significant scale will happen in a company only from the engineering perspective. For it to happen on a significant scale, we need resources. And who are the guys that control the resources of any company? They're the executives, the managers. Business case is what gets the attention. Now, if you can nail down a business case, a good business case usually will be done in conjunction with a sponsor. A champion is simply someone in executive management, CTO. If you're already the CTO, who has the credibility of your colleagues in the system, then you are well placed to be a champion. But in fact, you are the coach. You're going to be the cheerleader that will push the IPv6 agenda at the table where resources, resource allocation is discussed. In other words, you will open the gate of the resource allocation process to IPv6 deployment. That's the job of the champion. And not just that, sustain it because Every one of you, just think back to your organizations. Every single time a strategic initiative has failed, it often fails because the management loses interest. They catch another shiny thing. And once they lose interest, guess what? Not long after that, the resource allocation tabs close. And then it simply becomes something else that we should have done. Now, so a good business case and a champion, that will solve the problem of launching it, getting it off the ground, getting resources so that we can extend beyond just the FU core. Now, for the execution problem, I propose this, um, this great framework brought up by the guys at Franklin COVID. It's four disciplines. Look, how many people here made a New Year resolution in January? New Year resolution, anyone? No one, come on. <laughs> New Year resolution. Pretty much everyone makes new resolutions. And by the end of the, by the middle of the year, they just don't happen. What happens? Life happens. A new job, a new baby, you got married. And that important thing, that thing that was so important on December 31st, suddenly it is still important. You just can't cope with the other urgent and important things that is real life. So 4DX is a tried and tested methodology. More than 3,000 teams in the world using this methodology in everything from you know, finance to the IT industry. And my goal is how can we adapt this methodology to IPv6 deployment? So here's a real problem. As a network engineer, two task lists appear on the table in the morning. On the right, big clients had just went down. Or border routes at CPU spiking, or you need to install a link to the ISP. And there's another task list 
You need to do on your own study the research about IPv6 deployment. Or you need to create an IPv6 address plan or do IPv6 audits on the border router. Which one of these things do you think 95% of network engineers are going to attack? Which one of these lists? Which one? Pardon? Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We get to coffee soon enough. But which one of these lists do you think typically network engineers are going to attack? The one on the right. Because that is the real work. Which rack is this? That rack oh, or okay. that? <laughs> <laughs> the orange list. <laughs> the orange list. Because that is the real work. That is the stuff for which you get fired. You get a promotion. That is the stuff that keeps us in business today. But unfortunately, we could do that today or tomorrow, but that does not bring new capability into the organization. The stuff in green is merely important. The stuff in orange is, some of it is important, but it's all urgent. And we are all slaves to what that which is urgent. So how do we change that? Four disciplines. I started with there needs to be a business case. Because without a business case, you might as well go and sleep. Without a business case, you cannot have access to the resource allocation process. Without the resource, without access to the resource allocation process and the time, people, and money to roll it past the core, it's just never going to take off at that level. So first is, if you've got a good business plan, you have to craft a really specific objective about the IPv6 deployment. I've seen lots of objectives because I've looked at you know, plans from governments, from universities. You can look at some of those objectives and you can tell nothing is going to happen. Then. We're going to do something say, once you set a good goal, forget about the goal. You have to look at other measures to focus on if you want to drive engagement. And the best way to drive engagement is to keep score. And you drive accountability. It takes 30 minutes once a week. So let's do that. Focus. I believe every goal for every project and every business should be crafted in this format. Some verbs, some subject, from X to Y by D. Because if you craft it this way, it becomes, you know it when the goal has been hit and when you've missed it. A goal like uh, deploy IPv6, what exactly does that mean? Because if you simply say deploy IPv6, then all the guys who are put it on the core and on the edge, they've deployed IPv6. At the end of the year, it just really doesn't mean anything much. But if you put it this way, where X is where we are now, where we want to be, by what date? That is a better goal that drives action. So, some examples say increased percentage of our IPv6 internet traffic from 1% to 50% by 31st of December. That's a goal for which you can hold people accountable. Or, grow revenue from IPv6 supported services from $0 to $5 million per annum by 15th of May 2017. It just follows that formula. It's a goal that is measurable. You will know when you hit it. Now, once you set that goal, you need to forget about it. It's like setting, set, look, I want to, I want to lose um, 15 kg by the end of the year. The problem with setting that kind of goal and focusing on the 15 kg by the end of the year is that until the end of the year comes, I have no idea how well I'm doing. So you focus in IPv6, you have to look for small outcomes or behaviors, things that you can do on a weekly basis consistently that have to characteristics, we call them lead measures. They are things you and your team can do something about, and they are predictive. If you do them consistently, it's going to help drive IPv6 deployment. So examples of those are, for example, how many devices per day, number of IPv6 issues or tickets that you resolve per week, number of hours per day spent on an IPv6 infrastructure audit. Now, my experience with doing 4DX is this. You might need to do this a number of times. Need measures are quite difficult to find because it's usually not data that is just sitting out there. Most of the data that we have sitting out there in logging systems tends to be like, it happens after the fact. This one, you're looking for something that on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, gives you an indication. Am I getting there? So, need measures. Now, the bet you're making is this, that if you do things like this consistently, right, that goal is going to progress. 
and check that out every week in what we call a weekly meeting. Before you go to a weekly meeting, you have to what? The scoreboard. The scoreboard is simply you measure on a weekly basis how are people doing. It is something like this. Literally. And I never understood the importance of this until I saw the engagement that people had in them when they started keeping this call themselves. Now, this is a real scoreboard taken from a real project. And this scoreboard is built from data that the people themselves in the project put into the system. We just use Google Sheets to do that. And every week, 20 to 30 minutes, sit 20 to 30 minutes, it, this, what, this, this is what you do. Every person around the table, last week I committed to doing X. Have you done it? Yes or no? Then you look at the scoreboard together. You will know whether those lead measures you chose, are they moving your, your lack measure or not? So for example, if it's number of customers or percentage for IPvc traffic, those things you're doing, you know, either you're so resolving issues or you're doing infrastructure audits or you're installing equipment, those are bets you're making. You should see the thing that the big goal, IPvc traffic moving or revenue coming in, whatever. So we do this four things consistently and I can pretty much guarantee that we get a future target. I would love to say the typical approach to this has been an engineering approach. So if, if you look at activities deployment, you need to launch it. That is, make it such that you've got the resources to do it beyond your small circle of influence. I would say launching IPv6 successfully is not an engineering problem. It's a business problem. It requires a different skill set. Now, deploying it is an engineering problem because once you have the resources and you've got a good champion, the rest becomes complex, detailed complexity. Engineers are really, are really brilliant at that. So, I would say success is why compelling business piece, great champion, and for this piece. So, what's your excuse again? Thank you. Questions? Hello, Andrew here from Liquid. Um, I've got a couple of questions here, a couple of comments. For me, I agree we need a business case. But I've also argued that the business case, particularly in Africa, is being hampered by the fact that, first of all, I think import space is too available and too cheap. That's thing number one. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to get some comments on that. Thing number two. V6 at the moment in Africa is free. It's very, very difficult to get people to care about something that they're not paying for. So what, I've got an IPv6 block sitting there, I'm not using it. What effect would actually charging for V6 have from an RIR perspective with the people who are holding the V6? Would it make them care more? Something that we can think about. The other thing is, that in that slide where you've got the red and the, green, the orange and the green, yep. I would argue that the green side of it shouldn't actually be an engineer's problem. It should be done by a strategist. Um, because if you look at those things, the planning thereof and the research and the address plans, etc., that should be covered by strategy. If I give an engineer the job of creating an IPv4 addressing plan. The chances of them doing that either, that's just not what engineers do. You know, they like to play with things. And I would argue that on that green side, companies need to actually have proper strategy people to do that. Um, the other thing is, is that V6, as you said, should be part of key performance indicators. I take it a step further in our organization. If you deploy something and you don't do all step it, you get a warning letter. And if you don't do it again, I fire you. Because it's part of what you should be doing. So it's more than just measurables, it's actually about enforcing it to the point where you have to do it. And then there are a couple of other tricks to get people interested that I'll talk about on the panel in the next session. I don't want to go through it all. But my biggest concern is, is that I think that 
the vast pool of IPv4 space that is sitting in Africa, which we are not depleting, which we are not allocating, is busy killing our V6 deployment. And I'd like to hear your comment as an employee of Africa on what your thoughts on that are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, let me start with this talk that is within my circle of influence. <laughs> now, with respect to this list, um, you're like, what you just, in fact, everything you just described about what you do at Liffy, you are a champion. And because you care about IPv6, you've elevated it from something that is simply important, but also important and urgent enough that people care about it. Other companies that don't have a champion like you suffer. Now, if you actually employ someone who's a researcher, I don't, there are not that many companies in Africa who have people whose sole job is to look at stuff like this. But if they do, then this is not a problem. But I think too often, my experience with people who actually uh, but have been tasked with doing IPv6, they have lots of other things that they call my real job. And because unlike you, the incentive system still doesn't care about anything except the real job, people will do that which pays them. So that's what I was saying there. So yeah, if you actually could find someone and say, look, as your KPI for this year is to come up with XYZ, then what you've already done is you've brought focus to that stuff that needs to the IPv6 stuff that needs to be done. Now, uh, IPv6 being free, I would say things that are free have a questionable value because people, I think there's some part of people say, if this thing is so valuable, why are you getting it for free? I think one trick that could happen could be saying, if we decide to put a limit from now till a certain date, if we don't, we will start charging for IPv6. That might change the dynamic. I really don't know how. I really don't know what, how it might change the dynamic. But the fact that one thing I know for sure, one is the perception that it's going to become scarce, it becomes more valuable, and that might push people to get the IPv6. As so IPv4, the fact that it's still available, being a constraint, I would have to agree with you because it makes it even more difficult to sell that generic business case of IPv6 exhaustion, which is why I believe it actually makes a better case for a smart CTO to look beyond that generic business case. They're running out of IPv4. I can't claim that I have uh, all the answers to that, but I'll ask, for example, you, are, you run a network that's based in Africa, and yet you are doing it. It's certainly because you've seen some some case, some business case, it could be maybe five years down the road, that goes beyond simply we are running out of IPv4, or that we have sufficient IPv4. Yes. Okay. Um, if I could just make a comment about our business case. The business case is really, really simple. It's not about how much V4 that we've got. It's about the fact that the rest of the world is out of V4. And sooner or later, it's not far away. Somebody is going to have no option but to put something out there that is on V6 only. Mm -hmm. And at that point, my client is going to come to me and go, I either can access this because I've got V6 or I can't. By me being ready, my client will go, I can access it. My competitor's clients are not going to care about V6 or V4. They're simply going to go, I can't access what I want. Where can I go where I can? The answer is going to be liquid telephone, and I'm going to get a business boost out. That's simple. Thank you. Then I have my online. Um, I tend to agree with, with Andrew's point about the, the B4 space. As an internet community as a whole, we're running out of B4 space, but as an academic service region, we're not really. Um, you know, not in a meaningful way, not in a meaningful timeline. Um, and so we do need to think rather differently about it. I mean, for, for us, you know, and I'm one of those fortunate few that you were talking about in the beginning of your presentation, I get to decide that we're going to implement V6 this week till it gets done. Um, but for us, it's kind of more fundamental than that. 
we we're not I wouldn't I wouldn't term us a technology company necessarily, but technology has a very large impact on what we do every day. And IPv6 is the current version of the instant protocol. And sooner or later, a you know the, the state of readiness and the quality of my IPv6 topology is going to be the difference between me winning a large deal or losing a large deal. And I know from previous experience when when rolling out newish technologies that being ready for that day ahead of time versus trying to deploy it on the fly whilst provisioning an individual customer's service, whilst doing it you know the second way as possible, it's not fun. Yeah. And so so our goal has always been to always been to stay ahead of the curve. So that I never need to find myself in that position. Um, on the question of charging for the V6 space, it, it's it's I, I I take the point. It's it's slightly absurd to charge for V6 space because the whole point of it is that there's such a large address space that it's effectively unlimited, and charging for V4 space is effectively a rational system. And we don't need to actually be six space. That's the whole, you know, that, that's the whole point of the of, of the new address space. So, so doing that kind of, you know, doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I don't. Yeah, I think maybe I'll, maybe I'll leave it there. One thing I wanted to spot, just to uh, <laughs> no, the peanut gallery. <laughs> um, one thing I just wanted to 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 ask you is. Have you been involved in deployments that have successfully used this framework, or is this a recent kind of set of ideas that you try to put together and convince people to undertake? Or is this something that's actually had results? Okay, the methodology itself, I've got some, like, I've got experience with like um, ten different projects. But this year, I actually started my first rolling out of IPv6. So this is like you know, based upon insights that I've tried to. To tune into IPv6. The, the methodology itself is fairly recent. Um, okay. And again, so um, the purpose of this presentation was really targeted at what a team within an organization can do. But most of your comments and the comments from Andre are elements of a systemic solution that, you know, like the charging for V6, the fact that IPv6 is so free. Those are things that are in the circle of concern of someone who's in the company really can't do much about. And the solutions of that happen in fora like this, at academic meetings, at policies and all of that, um, I would really say out of the scope of my presentation. So one of the things that I always find interesting about this is that there are people still buying hardware that does not support these sets. Yes. And one of the things that techie people can very easily do when is not part of your KPIs, mm -hmm. is at least make sure that that tick box is on yes. on your procurement. Yes. Because, as has just been said, then catch up is going to be very expensive. So, in, 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 in line with that, for example, so if you consider, say, if there's a large consignment of equipment that has come in, for example, is there someone whose job it is to make sure that all of that equipment is really tested? That the IPv6 really logo or really label is actually meaningful. What kind of tests? Someone needs to design what these tests are. Someone needs to run the tests, and then you know, internally say this is good, this is not good. And I believe that it is small things like that we do. You see, the, the the problem with actually doing things that are only important and not urgent is that if you don't plan, say, commit yourself, say, I'm going to do it at a certain time, or a certain day, or a certain number per week, it just gets overrun by things that are more urgent. Which is why, if one of the, one of the, in my experience, one of the things that I've seen really important about it is, you make people understand, look, when you come for that weekly meeting, your day job is not a, an excuse, there is no excuse. Because in setting up what we call lead measures, you make people understand, yes, I understand you have a day job, that's why, 80% of your time is doing the job. That's why I'm acting for you. In fact, the, what we're currently doing, 
fast, just three things you do that week, only three. So 80% of the time, do your day job. The next week, I expect you to spend some 20% of your time to do those three things that you committed. And there's magic around that meeting because it typically goes something like this. You, the leader, you say, I committed to doing X. I've done it, I've not done it. There is magic around someone standing in front of their colleagues and saying, I committed to doing this last week and I did not. The second time it becomes ridiculous and they themselves know it. And that drives accountability and engagement like nothing I've seen. Um, I'm William Stuckey. Once upon a time, I used to be a network operator and I was one of the people who was involved in starting a company. Ben made an interesting suggestion about not trying to buy people. That's cool. The only problem is that Apple would then have to find a different business model. Which is maybe also a lot of Apple. Also, I care about Yeah. Uh, this may have only have relevance to William. Um, do, do we uh, ignore the, the market value that Andrew was talking about yesterday, around a million dollars per SAS 16? The market value of IP4 that we sit down with, who do we sit on with? Does that perhaps have a role in the uh, That's an interesting question. I, I think um, I sat through Andrew, Andrew's presentation last year, uh, not last year, yesterday. I think. It takes an, a geek who, on the, who can make a good link between, you see, this IPv4 addresses are becoming expensive, but what does it mean in terms of the things that matter to the guys who talk things like, you know, uh, ratios, profit and loss, you know, innovation and stuff like that. So yes, I think that if you could draw numbers to say, look, if we continue down this path, Right, considering the fact that it's a limited resource, at some point we'll start have to buy, we have to start buying it in the alternative market. This at these are going to be numbers two or three years from now, and they're not sustainable because we're going to be investing large amounts of money to a technology which is legacy and that brings no true additional value to our company and actually probably inhibits our ability to innovate in the future. I think that is an important element of the subject business case. Well, I thought we would become sellers in that model. Yeah. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> okay, first of all, let me state very clearly that I am not advocating becoming IP brokers. <laughs> uh, I, I, just, I just need to make that very clear. Yeah. Take it and move on. Um, before I get shot here. Um, but I will say this with regards to the value of V4. I know of a situation where a company was evaluating an acquisition in Africa and the price the people wanted for the company was kind of borderline. It was, yeah, okay, this is kind of worth it, maybe not worth it, where do we sit? Except it was then discovered that the company was sitting on a slash 16 worth of space. That adds $800,000 to the value of the company. Suddenly, the acquisition makes a lot more sense. These things are starting to play in the minds of people. Now, at the moment, it could be argued that this happened in Africa, the person can go and get space from Africa. <laughs> that depends on how you want to justify getting your space from Africa, if you can just buy it and you don't have to go through the headache of trying to justify and get the space out of Africa. <laughs> well, you know, it, it does actually make a difference. But I do think that making the case on the value of V4 is actually, it, it's a powerful driver because at the end of the day, V4 does cost a lot of money out on the secondary market and there is a limited time. At the moment, even while we, I say that Aquinix V4 pool is not depleting fast enough, I point out that the, the IP brokers have already, within the last year, we know, taken around a slash 11 out of the pool. And it's, it's increasing. This is why the Seychelles is sitting on an IP pool of almost 5 million IPs 
which amounts to multiple IPs per member of their population. Believe me, it's not being used in the Seychelles. It's going out to China, the States, wherever else. And we need to be aware of that as well and include that in our message to people. This pool is finite. And this is coming. And when it comes, if you're still with B4 and B4 is your only option, this is about to get very, very expensive. Okay, um, can I ask that we, the next session is also B6, so maybe you can keep that there. Yeah, thank you very much.